Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I'm Christy Truesdale, Deputy Director of the Children's Environmental Health Network. Thank you for joining today's webinar, The Business Case for Protecting Children's Environmental Health. This is the third webinar of our five-part series, Protecting Children's Environmental Health, The Blueprint in Action. Please make sure to join us for uh, the two remaining webinars, uh, the next one coming up in September on mobilizing society to protect children's environmental health, and the last one in our series in November about building the political will to protect children's environmental health. You'll learn about more achievements and incredible efforts underway to address children's environmental health in the United States. Before we get started, I'm going to address just a few logistical items. Um, first off, if you're only um, joining us via phone right now, hopefully you're able to access the slides by uh, downloading the ReadyTalk plugin. Um, you should be able to then access the slides on your computer, um, and you would be accessing that plugin from the link provided in the registration confirmation email that you received when you registered for this webinar. All lines are muted and are going to remain muted uh, throughout the presentations except for the presenters. You may submit questions at any time using the chat box on the lower left-hand side of your screen, and um, we will be answering all questions at the end, so after our very last speaker presents. Um, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Um, the webinar is going to be recorded and archived on the Children's Environmental Health Network website by tomorrow for your future use and for sharing, and we do hope you'll share this, and the link is going to be shared with all of you. So I encourage you to expand the conversation online. Um, Share what you're learning from this webinar on Twitter using the hashtag Children at the Center. Lastly, a, a brief evaluation survey is going to pop up at the end of this webinar. Please take a minute to complete the survey so that we can use your feedback and help make this webinar series as meaningful and helpful as possible to all of you. With that, uh, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this webinar, Inseto Obit Witherspoon. Ms. Witherspoon is the Executive Director of the Children's Environmental Health Network, where she organizes, leads, and manages policy, education, and training, and science-related programs. For the past 19 years, she has been a leader in the field of children's environmental health, serving as a past member of the NIH Council of Councils, on the Science Advisory Board for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the External Science Board for the Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes NIH research work. She is a co-leader for advancing the Science Health Initiative of the National Collaborative on a Cancer-Free Economy Network. Ms. Witherspoon is also a board member for the Pesticide Action Network of North America, the Environmental Integrity Project, and she serves on the Maryland Children's Environmental Health Advisory Council. Ensei? Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from in the country. Thank you so much, Christy, for all your wonderful work, uh, again, putting together a wonderful webinar. Uh, the Children's Environmental Health Network, for those that don't know, we're a national nonprofit, uh, almost 30 years old here, and we have always had the same mission since our very first start out in uh, California. We're now in Washington, D.C., where our headquarters is. And that mission has always been to ensure that all children have the right to the safest and healthiest environments possible. And we include the built, the biological, the chemical, and any physical environment where a child spends their time. Uh, so we uh, do this work by supporting the science in the field, translating that science into effective education, training, and all kinds of other uh, platforms that folks can then move in their communities into action. What, how can I best protect my family? That's some of the biggest set of questions that we receive on a weekly basis. How do I protect my students in my classroom? How do I better protect my, uh, my grandchildren? You know, people just want to know, what are the products I should be buying or avoiding to better protect ourselves? How do we think about our laundry detergent and on and on? Uh, we are the go-to national group for this type of 
set of issues and uh, obviously working at the policy level as well at the national and state level for child protective policies is how we also spend a lot of our time. We are very pleased that this webinar, again, as Christy mentioned, is one of our Education to Action series. This all came out of what's called um, a Blueprint for Protecting Children's Environmental Health, an Urgent Call to Action, which our first speaker, actually uh, David Levine, was an active part of years ago as we pulled together. This is a, a free available framework for the field. It's on our website, and it allows us, as the, one of the leaders in the, in the country working on children's environmental health issues and any other group or entity or business that may want to think about, how do I work my role? What is my responsibility? How can I prioritize this very large field? of how we can make a difference. And we have pulled out as an organization the key themes and they have then turned into these webinars which we are now making public uh, for all of you. So I will jump now into our uh, speakers for today, again making the, the business case for protecting children's environmental health. First it will be David Levine, uh, who is the co-founder and president of the American Sustainable Business Council. And then David will hand off to Brad Harrison, who's the Vice President of Marketing for Earth Friendly Products. And then our third speaker will be Barry Chick, Chick Founder and Technical Director of Naturepedic. So with that, uh, David, please begin. Oh, I'm sorry, and our agenda will be this. We will start as I've just mentioned. And yes, David is our first speaker, please. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Ense and Christy, and it's a pleasure to, to be a part of this webinar and also for ASBC to be co-sponsoring. And uh, so I, I think what's really crucial here for folks to understand is that you know, we certainly understand that a lot of the problems that, that we look at children's environmental health and the impact is coming from toxic chemicals toxic chemicals into materials and products, and those are produced by businesses. But since ASPC's founding, what we have done is gather together the responsible business, the sustainable businesses, the triple bottom line business, and you know, those businesses that are committed to moving beyond just short-term profit at all costs, and collectively between all the different business organizations and companies we now represent over 250,000 companies that recognize that you know, whether it's children's environmental health you know, or the health and well-being of our planet, our communities, our families and the like, that's front and center to doing business. That is the responsibility of business and the like. And, and so you know, today, you know, you know, it's important to sort of recognize that over the last 30, 40 years there's been the emergence of this new way of thinking for, for business. You know, and it comes, you know, out of the sustainability principles um, and the idea being that, you know, business can act differently, that we can move according to what create profit but at the same time also create environmental and social benefit. So, you know, here are some frames around, you know, the way that that is actually expressed. But the idea is that you see that these are integrated forms that are then built into the culture, the internal workings, the business practices, and as far as ASBC is concerned, you know, we built the, our organization as a way to also bring that voice forward into the public, into the media, and especially you know, into creating a public policy. So you know, really putting forward this different business perspective you know, into a new narrative and a new way of creating change. And, you know, one of the things that we've, we've seen over the last number of decades is that some of the influences, you know, that have driven businesses in this direction, whether it's, you know, from the outset in terms of their creation, you know, companies like Earth Friendly Products and Naturepedic that you'll hear from today. It's, the, you know, the growing demand from consumers. It's the employees asking the companies to do better 
concerned also about their own workplace health and safety. But it's also now the desire to, you know, whether it's the millennials or onward, you know, this idea that the best and brightest talent want to work for companies that have values that are aligned and the like. And then as you see as we go through the presentation, there's these opportunities, you know, for growing your market, for increasing your profit, for creating more and better jobs and the like. But make no mistake that a bunch of companies have moved because of the efforts of groups like you know, Children's Environmental Health Network and many others that have been advocating, that have been educating, that have been sort of pushing the understanding that, you know, that children's health has been impacted by toxic chemicals and that business needs to do a better job. So those advocacy campaigns have also played an important role. So, and for us, as I mentioned, you know, the way to get to long-term change is to actually develop you know, and advance and pass the kinds of policies that will help institutionalize this over time. So you know, as, as I was sort of mentioning, there, there's a number of different drivers, and certainly one of them has been the, the business risk the cost of doing business like this. You know, with the regulations that we have had in place, unfortunately a number of which are being threatened at the moment under the present administration, you know, you still have the fines that are levied against companies. There's the recalls that, that have an impact on business. But it's also now, if you look at what's just happened to Monsanto, now Bayer Monsanto and the like, you know, around Roundup, you know, the lawsuits that have moved through, you know, are hundreds and hundreds of millions. There's now thousands of lawsuits, you know, uh, around Roundup and the impact that that's had on health and the like. So stock prices, you know, as the lawsuits got announced and, you know, as, as, as these cases went through, the stock prices for Monsanto, for Bayer, dropped tremendously over time. So these financial impacts are obviously ones that are being paid attention to by other companies. They're not the only company that's had problems, chemicals out there by a long shot, and they're not the only ones to sort of see the financial impact when these get exposed and when the impact can be felt in this financial way. You know, but on the positive side, you know, what you also see that it, it's an incredible growth in, in business opportunity and market opportunity. You know, if you look at building materials, you know, a 2,000% growth in green building materials over this, this, this you know, 20-year period. You know, when you look at personal care products, you know, there's a 10, over 10% 10 compounded annual growth rate. Right, cleaning products, 20% compounded annual growth. And you can find a lot of this you know, on the uh, American Sustainable Business Council website. There's a, a full report that we did with a number of other groups on the business and economic case of safer chemicals. So you can feel free to use these resources as well. But clearly, you know, what there is is you know, you know, companies that are smart enough to produce these products you know, are being able to garner a larger share, and you see a much greater growth in companies producing safer, healthier products than you do with companies that are not. So, as I was mentioning, you know, the uh, ASBC really does focus on, on gathering the business community. Because why? Because, you know, often what you hear is when policies are being debated, you know, and you want to move through regulatory uh, policies or incentivizing green chemistry and the like, the arguments that are being made against those policies are normally made by the business community. So in establishing ASBC, what we now have is a countervailing voice and power to actually advocate for the right kinds of policies. So right now in Congress, we are working to advance a sustainable green chemistry bill that would, you know, incentivize further research and development in green chemistry. You know, there is a circular economy and sustainable packaging bill looking at the impact of plastics on our health and our economy and the like. And so that we're working through at the California level 
and the like. Or, you know, when we have to, you know, we need to oppose the bad bills that are being pushed by those in industry that still want to operate with the old paradigm of short-term profit, do whatever you want at all costs. And that's one of those bills is the Accurate Labels Act, which is actually the opposite of that. And you know, this is a bill that is looking to sort of use the, the sort of the national platform of passing a policy in order to override state policy that actually has in a number of states some stronger le regulatory frameworks to protect children's health, families' health, the environmental health in general. But you know, the, you know, having the business voice out there is really crucial, and you can see that in whether it was the passage of the Toxic Substance Control Act and getting some of the benefits that we're able to sort of push through there, or ingredient disclosure bills in California and in New York, and companies like the companies we have on the phone today were really active in those campaigns. You know, also, it's also crucial to sort of look at some of the emergence of some of the additional tools that are out there. You know, you have the Safer Choice program that EPA has been running that is still intact. There's the Chemical Footprint Project of Clean Production Action, the Pharos Project that, that you know, is, is working for the, the building and construction industries that's a great resource guide for products, or Made Safe or the initiative that ASBC has with the Sustainable Furnishings Council, which is sort of asking consumers and businesses to say, what's it made of? What kind of impact is this going to have? So these voluntary programs and certifications and resources you know, also play an important role in enabling business to do a better job as well. Um, additionally, you know, what we have sort of stepped forward to do in working with the Children's Environmental Health Network and a number of the other organizations that you see on this slide, you know, we have decided that it's really time to make the business case, but to also make the connection between the scientists, the cancer foundations that have been focused on the cure but not on the prevention piece of this, the environmental impact, you know, the public health leaders, investors, and legislators bring all those communities together so we can actually make a concerted effort to, to really protect the most vulnerable, right? You know, they don't have a voice in Congress. They don't have a voice in state legislatures. The media isn't calling up the kids to talk to them about these issues. So we have a responsibility to do that. So ASBC is helping to convene all these different players in order to advance this project that will come out with a very strong report, we hope, in the fall, along with then, you know, advocacy work, PR work, you know, and other efforts to really articulate the connection between chemicals, business practices, and the opportunity to create greater health and well-being and the like. So feel free to be in touch if you want to engage on this initiative as well. So additionally, you know, what we say is there are a number of different ways in order to sort of have an, an impact in businesses to do a better job by, a, a, you know, evaluating their own supply chain, you know, adopting chemical policies internally, you know, looking at the, the, the value and to not only the company but the society and making that a part of their outreach, their communication, their education to their consumers and the like, but also this idea of getting the multiple stakeholders working together in order to advance this issue and put it at the front burner that it needs to be. You know, this idea that, you know, we're not thinking about the generations to come by taking the immediate action now has got to shift. You know, whether you look at climate change or toxic chemicals, it's the same thing. You know, when we think for the long term and we improve our practices and our policies now, we can have a much greater impact. And what we really believe is that, yes, business has been a part, a major part of the problem, you know, but now it's business's responsibility working with others to be part of the solution and the like. So um, 
So we really appreciate this opportunity to sort of work with the Children's Environmental Health Network. And as you can see, there are a range of strategies that we're suggesting from policy to business innovation, investments, procurement, regulations, these metrics, the certifications, you know, and shifting the consumer de demand by education and their consumer and purchasing power and the like. But this idea here that now, you know, over the last number of years through ASBC and through the leadership of companies like the ones you're going to hear, you know, there really is now a business ally and a business voice and power advocating for children's health. So I'll stop with that. Thank you. And now we will uh, uh, turn it over to Brad Harrison uh, of Earth Friendly Products. Brad, if you could hit star 7 to unmute yourself, then you could probably get going. Okay. Well, thank you, David. I appreciate the, uh, the introduction there, and, and I just wanted to second everything you, you said. Uh, as a member of the uh, ASBC and, and working with your organization and, and working as part of it, uh, we just think the work that's being done there is amazing and, and something that, that we will continue to be supporters of as we move forward. Um, so it, it really is an honor to be here today and, and talk about the topic of children's health and protecting that because it's something that is certainly near and dear to our company. Uh, so please advance. Um, so sustainable plant-powered products are at the heart and soul of what we do as a company. For us, it's about environmental sustainability, but it's also about protecting the health and families, the health of families around the world. Uh, traditional petro uh, cleaning products, as David mentioned, are made from a number of different chemicals, uh, largely petrochemicals, some of which have been definitively linked to asthma, skin problems, allergies, and even to cancer. Um, research shows that people who become green really become concerned about the health and wellness of their family and they follow an in me, on me, then around me approach or evolution. Uh, first they think about their food and the things that they're ingesting and the things that they're actually feeding to their children. Then they think about their cosmetics and personal care products that they're putting on their bodies and on their children's bodies. And finally they begin to think about cleaning products and the things that they use around themselves and, and their families in, in their home environments. But if you think about you know, doing your dishes or doing your laundry, uh, when you do your dishes and you rinse the dish and you put it in the drainer and then uh, the next time you pull that dish out, there are still residues on those dishes. And so when you're thinking about what you're putting in your family and you're putting this great, clean, healthy food on your, fa in, on your family's plates, your family's then eating that off of plates that have chemicals on them uh, that are not good for your family. You think about laundry, the same thing. Um, Go wash, you know, after the call today, go turn on your laundry machine. Don't put anything in it. Just turn it on. The machine will get all sudsy and foamy. That's because there's leftover laundry detergent in that machine after you do the laundry. And so to the extent that that laundry detergent is not good for your skin and for your body, um, it's also left on your clothes after it's been washed. And your skin being your largest organ, it ingests into your body that way as well. So we make our products with safer plant-based ingredients. Uh, and they're made without dyes, parabens, phosphates, phthalates, optical brighteners, you name it. Um, all of our products are pH balanced, they're readily biodegradable, and we never test them on animals. So they're the safest that we know how to make them and the safest in the marketplace. Um, so if we advance, um, this is a, a photo of our CEO, Kelly Lahakis hanks who was unable to make it with, uh, uh, with us all today. I uh, had another conflict, so I'm trying my best to fill in for her, but um, if you look at our mission statement, it really is to protect the health and wellness of people, pets, and the planet by creating the most authentic, sustainable, and affordable cleaning products for all. Every one of those words in that statement we wrestled over, and words like affordable are really important to us because one of the challenges with greening up our environment and greening up our economy is 
lower income people are more susceptible to the problems of poor environmental and, and issues because they can't afford to buy their way out of it. So making products that are clean and green and are affordable to all is something that's really important to us. Um, so if we can just advance uh, one more time. Um, so as we talked in that, in that uh, statement about authentic, sustainable, affordable, when we talk about sustainability to us, it's really about the sustainability of the planet, but it's about the people and pets as well. And one of the, where we start with all that is the way that we manufacture our products. We're the only company in the world that has been able to achieve carbon neutral, water neutral, and zero waste. And if you take those three things and put them together, what we're trying to do is have the minimum, the minimalist footprint that we can possibly have on the environment. And we accomplish that by having as little waste as possible, as little impact on the water as possible, and as little impact on the air and the planet as possible through that, that carbon, water, and, and waste neutrality. Um, and so we've been a company that's been trying this and doing this for years. In fact, our company this year is 52 years old, which is three years longer than Earth. We've been around three years longer than Earth Day, three years longer than the EPA, and five years before the Clean Water Act. So we're really, and, and even one more thing, we're twice as old as our nearest competitor. So we're a company that's been doing this for a long time, and, and we think we do it better than anyone, but yet every year we're wake, working to do it better and better. Um, and so we have sustainable products and we have sustainable manufacturing processes. But what's most important, if you skip to the next page now, sorry. Um, what's most important to us is the sustainability of, and safety for human life. And, and that's where we really get today to talking about the children and how we relate to our children. Today we see increases in so many different health problems from chronic conditions like asthma and eczema and acute conditions like cancer and nerve and organ damage. We know today that one in eight women will get breast cancer in her lifetime. One in 12 will face difficulties breathing because of asthma. And this year alone, over 10,000 children under the age of 15 will be diagnosed from cancer. Not all of those due to household cleaners or chemicals, but if it's even one, that's too many for us. Um, what we do know is that there are definitive links between some of these toxic ingredients and cancers. And we know that, and so from our perspective, until everybody is using clean, clean green ingredients and selling clean green cleaning products, there still is work to be done, and so we'll continue to do that. Um, so what can we do, which is really what today's about, and I want to get into that. Um, it's easy to feel hopeless, um, and, and our CEO, Kelly, talks a lot about the experience that she had as a young girl at 14 when she found out her mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. Her mother struggled, she lived for a while, but she ultimately ended up dying of breast cancer. And from that experience, Kelly has taken on this mantle of, we have to not just be sustainable for the environment, which is what her father founded this company on, but we also have to be sustainable for the people on the planet as well. And the ingredients have to not only be good for the environment, but good for the human health. And so as a company, we can, we're 100 percent committed to doing that. We also are 100 percent committed then, as David mentioned, to partnering with people like the American Cancer Society, who we've partnered with now for the past eight years um, and helped raise tons of money and tons of awareness of the issues of chemicals in, uh, in cleaning products. Um, so if we go to the next page, a um, couple things to talk about here. but. Thankfully, more than ever, consumers are finally catching on to all of this and are really thinking about what goes into the products that they bring into their homes. Today, more and more consumers are becoming what we call forensic consumers. They're searching for this information online before they bring it home and feed it to their children or clean the clothes that, that their children use. They're looking at reading those in ingredients, and they have in the store with them this incredible device that's only been around for a few years, but this mobile phone that has really revolutionized your access to information. And so what we want to see and really encourage continuing seeing more of is these forensic consumers using those phones wherever they are to learn the most they can learn and make the most educated, best um, consumer purchasing decisions that they can make. And we see more and more consumers doing that. One of the ways we help people is we're one of the um, 
leading supporters of Safer Choice. And David mentioned it a little bit earlier today, but uh, I'm proud to say that more of our products are US EPA Safer Choice certified than any other company. Um, we've twice been selected as their Safer Choice Partner of the Year. And the reason we're so involved in it is we think it's a great symbol for consumers to look for on our products. But the reason it's such a great symbol is that the US EPA created not just a system that ensures that these products have the safest ingredients, but they also require those products to be tested to meet high standards for performance and efficacy. So it really is a safer choice in terms of your literal safety for your family, but it's also a safe choice because you know it's going to work and work for you. Um, and the other thing that we love about the product is the third part of that uh, safer choice uh, certification is every one of our products which have been certified have to be recertified every three years, and every three years we have to show them that we've made progress and further improvements and kept up with the latest in green science. So we love the program in that it's a great symbol for consumers to look at, and that symbol and some of the others that David mentioned, we think it's important to help raise the awareness that those are out there to help people make decisions, but we still think it's important that they're looking on the back of the labels and finding out what those ingredients are and getting themselves familiar with what those ingredients are and what they do. So that, that's important to us. Um, so I can go to the next page now. The challenge has been that most products out there on the shelf do not tell you what's in them. It's been required by law for years for food. It's been required by law in cosmetics for a number of years, but only California recently, as recently as 2017, and David talked about the Clean Product Right to Know Act that David and our company and a number of other companies got together and, and worked hard with the state of California to get passed. That law will be taking effect in the next couple of years, and when it does, it will require cleaning companies to put those ingredients on their packages. And the good news, in addition to what we've done in California, is there's now a law passed that has been passed but has been um, put up for uh, execution and, and implementation in the state of New York as well. And there are other states looking at it now every day. So we believe that in the next few years we'll go state by state through this until we get to such a swell that the, the federal government will actually uh, jump in and pass this law too. But the point is it's a really important law for consumers, and we're excited about it. Um, so now that companies must embrace transparency, uh, we want consumers to demand that they do even more and to continue to push companies to do good and clean up, not just be transparent about what's in there, but we believe, we believe when they have to present it uh, on the package of what's in there that they'll also want to clean it up and create better products with better ingredients. Um, so we believe as a company, it's not – the idea, and David talked about the triple bottom line for businesses, that it's, that it's important – uh, to them, we believe being good and doing good with the environment and with the health of our consumers is actually good for business in both the short term and long term, but at least and especially in the long term. And we believe that businesses have that responsibility. And you can even look at it and, you know, people who say businesses only responsibility is to their shareholders. It is their responsibility to their shareholders to do these things because it's how they will maximize their profits for the long term. So Forgetting all the right and do good and do the right thing, it's right for businesses to do this. And, and we believe we're proving that every day with, you know, what we're able to do with sustainability in our manufacturing processes and in our ingredients, and we believe other companies can follow that um, as well. So I guess as moving forward for, as consumers today, the things that I think you can do are become a forensic consumer um, and have your family vote with their dollars for products that protect and enrich the health of your children and the environment. But don't just vote for your dollars, also vote, period. We need more of our government officials and more of our state and local and national um, uh, organizations to recognize the crisis that our planet, and more importantly, our children's planet, is in right now. And whatever you do, all I would you know, encourage you to do now is continue to, to, to be curious, continue to learn more, and continue to push those who have the power to fix this, whether that's business, government, or others, and continue to support all those nonprofits that are trying to fix it as well. And, and that 
to me is, is what we're doing in our company and what I would encourage you to do. Um, so if we can advance to the last page. Um, this is just who we are and what we make. But we make over 200 plant-based cleaning products. 150 of those are Safe for Choice certified. 148 are Safe for Choice certified. Um, we make the Ecos cleaning products. We also make baby Ecos products that are formulated for the sensitivities of infants and small children. Um, and we make a pets line because, again, we're about protecting people, pets, and the planet. So I'd love for you to buy our products, but whether you buy ours or some other green products, what I would really encourage you to do is please buy green, please buy smart, please use your dollars to reward the companies that do the right things and withhold them from the companies that don't. And that will further incent their activities to do more of what they should be doing. Um, we owe it to ourselves. We owe it to each other. And most importantly, we owe it to our children to create this planet that's a better place than we got it when, they, when we took it over. And right now, we're not doing that. So everything we can do to help those children, I want to encourage all of us to do. So thanks for the opportunity to speak, and I look forward to questions and answers. Great, and now we'll pass it on to Barry uh, Chick, uh, the founder of Naturepedic. So Barry, if you hit star 7, you can get started on your presentation. And thank you, Brad. Wonderful. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much, David. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Children's Environmental Health Network. And of course, thank you to the American Sustainable Business Council, the most wonderful uh, group uh, that's that's uh, going to change the entire country, and we're happy to be a part okay. of it. We really, we really are. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm Barry Chick, As I was and, uh, and uh, I'm actually not from the mattress business originally. I'm a board-certified environmental engineer, uh. and I've done a lot of uh, professional work over the years. I've been chasing chemicals for over 40 years, and uh, I got into the mattress business because my wife sent me to a baby store about 15 years ago to buy a crib mattress and a few other things for our first grandchild, and I quickly realized that all the mattresses were polyurethane foam, flame retardants, vinyl, uh, phthalate, um, plasticizers, formaldehyde, pesticides, GMOs, glues. <clears throat> I asked the salesperson, uh, gee, what else do you have? And the, uh, the response was, uh, come on, cut it out. If it wasn't safe, it wouldn't be approved. It wouldn't be allowed to be sold. So uh, unfortunately, I knew better, and uh, I came home, and I was kidding around with my wife, and I said, you know what? Our grandparents slept on straw. That's healthier than, what, than, than what's available in the store today, and we need to change that. And that's how, that's how Naturepedic started, uh, because we refused to let our grandchild sleep on all these toxic chemicals. So uh, meanwhile, the uh, public is changing and the public wants safer products, uh, non-toxic products, organic products. And uh, if you look at the chart on the right, which is the important one here, you can see how uh, organic is growing. Uh, the blue is the organic food sales, unbelievably, great growth. And now you can see that the green, which is organic non-food sales, uh, including mattresses, uh, is beginning to grow substantially as well. Uh, the non-food organic market is only a fraction but there is of the organic market, but there's plenty of room for growth. And this is going to be where, the, where some of the biggest growth will be occurring. And this, this covers uh, cleaning products like Brad just discussed, mattresses, which is what we do, and, and other such consumer products. The question becomes, what's the cost of organic manufacturing? Is it really, uh, is it really uh, a lot more expensive? So uh, here are a couple bullets you'll see in the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the bottom half. Uh, organic materials cost more, but the prices are getting closer to conventional every year. So yeah, uh, it does cost a little bit more, but it's really not that much more. And studies, studies have shown that more and more people are willing to pay, you know, a little bit more um, f 
for an organic product, whether it was 20 or 30 or 40 percent more. You know, if it's a really different, healthier product, the public is willing to pay for it. And we, uh, we for one, are able to make products that, that can be relatively uh, um, comparable in price to, to some of the mainstream products. In fact, in some cases, even less expensive. Um, organic certification adds an additional cost. Yes, that's correct. Um, and we have to incur that cost, but we, but when you, it gets to a point where it's not that big a deal. Uh, you, you're getting the volume, and it's it's fine. Uh, it is possible to make a competitively priced organic version of a product using better design, and that's part of the trick. Is if you stop and and you rethink the process as to how to design a product, uh, many times you can come up with a smart idea that's that's just a good price-wise and, and much more environmentally friendly. Organ uh, Naturepedic has been able to make an organic competitively priced mattress product. Absolutely. The organic consumer product market grows steadily every year, and that's the case. Okay. Uh, we started in about 2003, uh, you know, with nothing. Uh, we invested the, our profits every year, and uh, right now we're well over $20 million a year. And basically, uh, all we did was make a good product and show it to the show it to the public. All right. Um, when you manufacture with organic and organic approved materials, you eliminate worker exposures to all kinds of hazardous toxic chemicals. So, if you look at the left column, you know, on a typical mattress, um, you'll have waterproofing, you'll have antibacteria. Uh, bacterial antimicrobial. By the way, when you see something, a product that says antibacterial, you th you think, oh, that's great. But what what they're not telling you is they, by law, they had to treat that product with a pesticide. Okay. So once you understand that that product has been treated with a pesticide, is that really what you want to sleep on, or is that really what you want your baby to sleep on? Uh, and it changes the what, what, once once the public becomes aware, it changes the entire thinking. All right, then there are flame retardants, flame barriers. People will tell you there's, there's no flame retardants, it's just a flame barrier. Well, guess what? What do you think the flame barrier is made of? It's made of flame retardants. So, um, you know, people like, like to play games with words, but uh, flame, flame retardant chemicals are not the kind of thing that we like, and we won't use them, of course. Plastic softeners, phthalates, we don't use those things. Plastic hardeners. Then there's various fill materials that, that are found. Uh, the big one is polyurethane foam, all kinds of problems with that, including formaldehyde and so on. Then there's plant fiber fill, but the problem there is most of the plant fiber fill is made with GMOs. We certainly would not use those kind of materials. And then there's many other kinds of uh, residual chemicals, vinyl chloride, dyes, heavy metals. All these kinds of things uh, are in the product, Okay, and there they would be they would be hurting the workers who make these products, and these are typical things that are found in mattresses every single day, and and we realize that this this has to change, it has to change in a very big way, and we refuse to use any of those kinds of materials. Okay, so Naturepedic was I founded it in 2003 when I went uh, into a store, and uh, I just would not. Would, could not agree to, to all those t toxic chemicals. And uh, at the time, organic mattresses were just nothing more than miniaturized adult mattresses, which made no sense for babies. At the time, we were just doing baby mattresses. Today, of course, we do everything. So we set out to make Naturepedic, and it's grown and grown and grown. All right, here are some of the problems that uh, existed before Naturepeda came along, and the same basic idea, but these are some of the, the basic problems. Polyurethane foam, volatile organic compounds are coming out of most mattresses. Polyvinyl chloride is on all, most baby mattresses. Flame retardant chemicals are in most mattresses, period. Polyfluorinated compounds, or PFCs, are waterproofing used on many baby mattresses. Pesticides are used on many mattresses. Genetically modified organism, organisms, GMOs, are all over the place. And then, of course, there are 86,000 chemicals in the marketplace, and you just don't know which chemicals are reacting with which other chemicals. You don't know what's causing cancer. 
what's causing this, what's causing that. It's a serious problem. All right. Um, polyurethane foam has been called solid gasoline and because it's basically, basically petroleum. Uh, we replace polyurethane foam with organic and plant-based materials, organic wool, organic cotton, organic latex, PLA made from sugarcane, non-GMO only, polyethylene from sugarcane, non-GMO only. Uh, PVC, polyvinyl chloride, uh, is usually the waterproofing on, on a baby mattress, and PVC uh, has phthalates, which are clearly toxic. Uh, of course, we don't want to use stuff like that. We, don't, we replaced polyvinyl chloride with organic wool, organic cotton, non-GMO sugarcane, and non-GMO polyethylene. For the waterproofing, it's basically non-GMO polyethylene from sugarcane. All right, flame retardant chemicals are found everywhere, not just in your mattress. They're in your couch. They're in your upholstered chairs, uh, and so on. We, we do not use flame retardant chemicals. We use wool or we use cotton, which are not highly flammable at all. And we're able to pass all the government regulations just like we're required to, just like everybody's required to, without using these toxic chemicals. Summary, here are some of the, uh, here are some of the, the, the materials that are commonly used. On the left side, polyurethane foam, polyvinyl chloride, phthalates, VOCs, flame retardant chemicals, formaldehyde, polyfluorinated compounds, pesticides, GMOs, glues. We replaced all that with organic cotton, organic wool, organic latex, non-GMO plant-based fiber, basically sugarcane, non-GMO sugarcane-based polyethylene, recycled steel, the steel that we use is recycled, and thermal sealing, in other words, heat sealing, no glues whatsoever. This is our pledge and make, to make it very simple, uh, babies and toddlers spend 10 to 14 hours a day sleeping, so it's even worse for them than for the rest of us. But of course, this issue applies to all of us. Uh, we, spend, we spend a third of our lives on mattresses, and from the moment you walk in the door to your house to the moment you walk out, you spend the majority of that time on a mattress. So if you care deeply about getting a nice dining room set, you know, or a nice, uh, you know, sound system. Uh, how about the mattress? The mattress needs to be a healthy, non-toxic mattress. And uh, we, we, uh, Naturepedic uh, works with other organizations, including in particular the American Sustainable Business Council. We support them, and we want to change the way things are done uh, in, in this country. Uh, if you want to create a chemical, you, uh, there needs to be rules. And if you can pass those rules, okay. But if you can't, you, have, you should have no right to create that chemical. And we're prepared to work with the American Sustainable Business Council and many other groups, including the Children's Environmental Health Network, to, to change the laws and to start a revolution. And it's time, it's time for people to have non-toxic uh, uh, consumer products. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Barry, and thank you again to David, Brad, and Barry. Really appreciate it. I think what's a, a very different type of discussion for our child health advocate audience and hopefully uh, many others that we've been able to draw to this topic today. So we do have about, you know, just under 15 minutes for some um, questions. Just as a reminder, please do type in your questions in the text box on the actual monitor, and then we can um, ask those questions of the presenter if it's to a specific presenter please let us know. And Pete Myers actually has a question for Brad Harrison. Um, great vision, but there is one concern. If you don't use animal testing, how do you know you have ingredients that are, uh, that are um, not endocrine disrupting chemicals or are endoc endoc endocrine disrupting chemicals? Uh, missing the rest of it here. Plant-based uh, can be um, endocrine disrupting chemicals as well, plant-based materials. So how do you are you able to differentiate um, and be clear um, if you're not animal testing on your products? And Brad, you have to uh, star you, seven. Yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I think it's a great question, and it's one of the reasons we work with the uh, US EPA and Safer Choice, uh, where they have a list of ingredients which have been tested and proven to be safe 
And in order to gain uh, safer choice certification, we have to have to formulate our products with ingredients off of that list. Um, but it, but it's a great point. Um, people talk about natural. You know, there's a lot of things that are natural that can kill people. It's it's a good point. Uh, and so when you're looking for natural products, you need to look for products with the ingredients that are known to be non-endocrine disruptors and things of that nature. And so that's where we work with uh, with the EPA on that that list. Thank you, Brad. Uh, I think there's also a question about, uh, kind of a second question about um, uh, maybe uh, questioning th that process because there have been many that have uh, had concerns about whether endocrine disrupting uh, testing is going to the extent that it could and should at EPA. And I'm wondering if you have any comments to that. Uh, I, I do not. I, I don't okay. uh, have comments on the EPA's processes now. Thank you. Any other questions for our presenters? Please do type them in here. And Christy, I think you had a couple that we had um, prepared anyway. Okay, we've got one, another one for Brad. Um, how does earth-friendly products address fragrance chemicals? Do you have any products that comply with safer chemicals, the fragrance-free label? Um, we have uh, fragrance-free products we call free and clear, which are products which are free of all fragrances, dyes, all these you know, phthalates, all the things I mentioned earlier. Those That product line, um, Excuse me, it's not a product line. It is a, it is a variant within most of our product lines. So laundry detergent, dish soap, hand soap, just about all of the different product lines that we make are available in a free and clear uh, variant. As far as fragrances go, what we do is we work with the, uh, the fragrance providers, the fragrance houses, to distill products, uh, excuse me, to distill fragrances from the actual essences and the ingredients themselves. So when we say it's a lavender fragrance, it, it's literally derived from lavender. It's all natural fragrances for a number of regulatory and legal reasons. Within the United States, the word natural is heavy regulate, heavily regulated. So we don't use the phrase, but, but all of our fragrances come from lavender. They come from uh, lemongrass, where we say it comes from lemongrass, et cetera. So the, the formulas are natural within the fragrances, and then many of our product lines, almost all of our product lines, are available in a fragrance-free variant as well. Thank you. Uh, Layla McCurdy, one of the networks, the Children's Environmental Health Network board members, says, great panel, question for all speakers. How can the environmental health community help your efforts? And just remember to please put yourself on star seven so that you can all contribute. So I don't know if, David, if you want to jump in first or Barry. I'm happy to jump in. Do you hear me? Yes. Um, it's all about education. Uh, once, once, uh, once anybody, any, any citizen, once he or she understands the issue of toxic chemicals in the environment, toxic chemicals in consumer products and toxic chemicals that could be actually hurting their health in addition to environmental health, of course. Once the consumer understands that basic point, uh, it's over. Uh, they will demand change from all their, you know, all their purchases, all right? So what needs to happen right now uh, more than anything, is simply to get the message out, very clear message. And the very clear message is, A, uh, 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 number one, your products contain toxic chemicals. Number two, toxic chemicals will, will harm you health-wise. Number three, demand uh, that toxic chemicals be removed. That's the message that has to go out uh, to the public. Thank you. Yeah, David here. What I, what I would also add is, you know, for, certainly for the environmental health organizations, sort of as demonstrated by some of the work that, you know, uh, uh, the environmental, 
you know, uh, health community is doing with ASBC and the like, it's to really call upon, you know, ASBC, you know, you know, utilize the business leaders that we have as you're advocating for change out there. Make the business case, you know, what, you know, you know, even see in the presidential debates, you know, a slamming of businesses, but not a lifting up of the right kind of business. And what folks need to know is that there are solutions out there and there are responsible businesses. You know, and the you know, businesses and business leaders as advocates can make a substantial difference. You know, a number of years ago, the styrene industry bought itself a congressional hearing through its lobbyists and campaign contributions because of the report that the National Institute for Environmental Health Science had put out around, you know, uh, carcinogenic um, chemicals, so chemicals tied to being cancer-causing, and styrene was listed there. So they got themselves, they wanted to squash the report. And, you know, the environmental health community got in touch with ASBC, and we were able to provide business leader that was able to testify at the hearings to basically say that there are safer alternatives out there, that there are companies that can produce air, you know, you know, chemicals that do what styrene does without causing the damage that styrene does. So being able to sort of work in partnership and utilize the business and economic perspective as a part of the rationale, uh, you, know, you know, can go a long way because the report was not squashed and we were able to use that business case in order to counter the false business perspective that was being offered up by the styrene industry. Uh, this, and this is Brad. Just to um, add on, I'm 99% I'm aligned with uh, what Barry was saying. It's, it's really what, what you guys can do and what the environmental health community can do is educate. Um, what I would add to that is advocate, and, and what I'm thinking specifically about is what I'm talking about today is, you know, the chemicals that you put into your home, the chemicals that you bring into your house, the quality of food that you're eating, the quality of cosmetics that you're using, all those things are important to you, but also think about what you're, what you're living in most of your day at work. And is your work environment as healthy as it should be? And are, are you working in healthy buildings? And are you, you know, the chemicals that you're having to manage and, and deal with as a worker in your, in your work environment, ask your employers to do more and do better for you there as well. Um, and, and I think that that really would, will help as well. But it, it really needs to go beyond what you buy to just where you live, how you live, and, and wherever you go. Um, I think it was in Barry's presentation, but he talked about there's 86,000 untested chemicals out there. I think it's fair to assume that what, what you're using contains things it probably shouldn't. And so you should be aware of everything that you're ingesting and using in and on and around your body throughout the day um, because there's an assumption that, well, if the government lets it go on the shelf, it must be good. And in fact, I think very little of what gets to the shelf is actually tested and approved by the U.S. government. Um, and I think that's a, a fallacy in our system of where we have a false sense of security. And I think Barry kind of called that out really well, that that's something that you need to be vigilant and advocate for yourself and educate yourself as a consumer, as a citizen, um, and that we would encourage all of that. Thank you. That point is really um, well um, speaks well uh, at the Children's Environmental Health Network, and we try to articulate that a lot, and try to therefore, while many of our partners and and uh, uh, coalitions out there that we're a part of are actively trying to um, change that paradigm shift, it is a huge paradigm shift to change. And obviously, educating our general public is just as vital because there are alternatives um, in many cases out there, and folks should be aware of them. There could be still barriers, as we talked about, even economic barriers at times. But at least knowing that there are alternatives and then looking at what, what your options are is vital. Um, David, there's one last question, maybe in the last 30 seconds, if you're able to come up with a, a, a quick answer. What business sectors are underrepresented in your association, and how might you be trying to engage com – I don't know if you want to call out companies or just sectors themselves, you know, if you were ideally able to fold in 
a few more top priority sectors out there into the American Sustainable Business Council. Who's kind of on your priority list, if you could share any of that? Well, you know, right right now, I, I'd say, you know, one of the, the areas that we're trying to tackle because of the attention that it, it's getting as well is really around plastics and sustainable packaging and the like. So I think, you know, it, it runs across all sectors, you know, but it's campaigns like that that I think give us an opportunity to, to really coalesce a broad business message and a broad business movement that sort of raises these multiple issues. Because, right, you know, when looking at plastics, you're looking at the basic pollution, you're looking at the source materials of petroleum products and the chemical additives that are in there, you know, you're looking at the impact on climate as well. And so, you know, what we're trying to do then is look across sectors, bring them together, you know, around those kinds of campaigns that have got the public and the media attention at the moment and really sort of come up with the kinds of business solutions, you know, that, you know, would move us beyond the problem to the kinds of solutions to protect our broader public and environmental health. Well, I want to close us out. I want to, again, thank all three of our speakers. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for uh, continuing to raise the bar, continuing to challenge your own organizations and, and your partners and those within your networks, because we all know that there's much better out there, um, and for continuing to set that bar. Thank you for continuing to consider the, the health and well-being of all children, and especially the most vulnerable um, and uh, thank you all for participating today. And again, this will be archived. We do hope that you do fill out your evaluation and spread the archived version when available to other colleagues and friends and partners. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.